Um, and uh, so we are to guide our heart. In other words, we are to tell our heart what to desire and what not to desire. We still will struggle with our flesh our entire life, but we can choose what we are going to put our fo uh, set our affection. The Bible says, "Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth." We can choose, and if you don't believe that we can choose, what do you think of a man or a woman who cheats on their spouse to with someone else? What do you think of that person? You, 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 I'm just following my heart. You know, I was going to work one day, and, and my secretary just stole my heart. Or I was on the internet one day, and this cute guy I met, he stole my heart. I'm just following my heart. No, we don't look positively on that. We say, no, no, you need to choose what to desire, what not to desire. You need to say, no, I'm not going to look at any other person. What did we say at the marriage altar? Forsaking all others. Okay? So we understand that when it comes to... Um, uh, marriage relationships and those things, all right? And so we, we do actually understand, even the secular world really does understand, you choose what your heart fit, sets its affection on and what you allow to come into your mind as a possibility, as a direction you might go. So we're talking about that, and then the next message I preach is called Singing with Grace in Your Hearts to the Lord. And I was talking about how music is very powerful and it actually shapes your heart and your desires. And so we are to sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. So when we sing, we are to be meditating on the grace of God and singing to the Lord about that. And then music becomes a way that our heart is changed, that our heart is protected. And then um, we talked about the first song in the Bible, which is amazing to me, but it's in Exodus 15, and it's a song of salvation. I will sing unto the Lord. For he hath triumphed gloriously, a horse and his rider as he thrown into the sea. And we're talking about what are the what are the, what are the what's the kind of music that we need to um, to be singing. And actually, I I, uh, I skipped ahead. What was another? What was the one I preached before that? It was uh, it wasn't called Lester Crowley. <laughs> it was about Lester Crowley, but uh, it was um, things offered to idols. Okay, so Lester Crowley was someone who died in 1947. He started a religion. Uh, he had a, a, a book that was dictated to him by an Egyptian god who appeared to him. And it was called the Book of the Law, Do It Thou Wilt the Whole of the Law. Most people have never heard of him because the people who followed his ideas didn't tell necessarily everybody they were teaching his ideas. But they were the, the people like the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, the people in the in the 60s and 70s who actually had Aleister Crowley's teachings all woven throughout their music and they taught this, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, do whatever you want, which is the opposite, right? Of guide your heart, okay, is the opposite. And they spread those ideas throughout our culture in the music and that music was very specifically a very heavy dominant beat, okay, is how it differed from music that had come before, even though there was worldly music before that, but it wasn't the same thing, and loud screaming through guitars, okay, that was the style. And that music was used and developed by these people because it was very powerful and it had the power to offer that it was used as an offering to the idolatry of worshiping the devil, what Alester Crowley taught, and also worshiping yourself, which is kind of the same as worshiping the devil, because when the devil tempted Adam and Eve, he didn't tempt them to worship him, he tempted them to become gods. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay? And so it was in it seemed like it, it came in through the music. And I just want you to know, and I told you this before, the people that went to Woodstock and listened to all those groups and everything and bought into that idea do whatever i want that's why abortion's okay and everything is okay and then the, the craziness that we're seeing in our culture today with as i preached before and the lgbt and transgender all these things that are insane where people are literally not even able to grow up and become normal people because of decisions that they're making and their parents and the teachers are making them too young to decide for themselves too young to even know whether they're making the right decision it's very tragic and all of that is Follow your heart. Do what makes you feel good. Um, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. It's tragic. But it came in through that music. Okay? And uh, what the argument that I made to you that week was there is a form of that music that is the same style but with Christian words. And people say, well, if I just put Christian words, that makes it okay. And what I tried to explain to you is that style of music is something that's offered to idols. 
And the Apostle Paul taught in 1 Corinthians, there were Corinthians who said, I can eat meat that's offered to idols, it won't hurt me any. And he actually told them, you're actually right, you could actually eat that meat that's offered to idols, but then he gave a series of explanations to them why they still should not eat that meat. And we talked about that's another message. Um, but there's a reason why you shouldn't, and it has to do with how it affects weaker people, and how it becomes fellowship with devils. He said, I don't want you to have fellowship with God and fellowship with devils. Not worshiping devils, but fellowship with devils. And it gets us too sucked into that culture and it leads us down a bad road. And that's why we need to stay away from, I believe, that style of music, not just the words, but the style itself. It's a thing offered to idols. And the Apostle Paul explains that in there. Okay, and then we talked about last week um, about a song of idolatry. Uh, the second song mentioned in the Bible is when they worship the golden calf. It said, it's a noise of war, all right? Remember that? Joshua was a warrior, and he's on his way down the mountain, and Moses has not told him what's going on. The reason I know Moses hasn't told him is because he says there's a war going on down there. And if Moses had told him they're worshiping a golden calf, he would have known. So Moses was probably too angry about what's going on. He probably just, you know, in one of those gruff men moods, like, don't touch, don't touch me. I don't want to talk. He's angry. He's carrying those... And, of course, he ends up going down. He sees the calf and the dancing, and he breaks the tablets. You know all that, okay? I don't know if they were iPads or Android. No, anyway, so he breaks the tablets. But, but on the way down, he says, there's a sound of war. There's a noise of war. I want to tell you, I, I really think that noise, you know, you know with that same that last Sunday that we were down ice skating, and they're playing all this grinding, screaming electric guitars and the heavy dominant beat. And I was just like, man, I never thought about it until I preached that message. I was like, this sounds like the noise of war. That's what it sounds like. And so I'm not saying I know exactly what that music sounds like. I'm not saying it's the exact same sound. But I am telling you, like, what I was listening while I was ice skating. And this is music, by the way. I went to these concerts in my teens. Okay? And I, there was a time in my life where I enjoyed that kind of music. And now I'm listening. Okay, it really does sound like war. That's what it sounds like, a noise of war. And that's what they were using to worship their idol was a noise of war. Okay, and um, so Joshua literally thought it was, and he said, it was the, it's the sound of them that same do I hear, all right? So we talked about that last week. And the thought that might come to your mind, before I get into this, the thought that might come to your mind is, you might be like, okay, pastor, you convinced me, unless Lester Crowley's a bad guy, that's not hard. Um, you convinced me that that music that they sang, maybe I shouldn't be listening to Led Zeppelin, maybe I shouldn't be listening to these heavy metal groups that talk about the devil or, you know, and I know I'm dating myself. Marilyn Manson was kind of my generation, okay? And I, you know, I'm not necessarily familiar with everything that people are listening to today. I um, mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have the time or the patience or energy. I don't need to know what everybody's listening to here and, and what all the most popular songs are. That's not important. We need Bible principles and you'll be able to make your own decisions for your own life. If your desire is to please God and serve him, you'll be able to evaluate the movies that you watch, the music you listen to, the places that you go, the friends that you have, and you will know if something is, is hurting your Christian faith or not. I don't have to be, you know, micromanaging your life and, like, supervising you and all those things. That's something the Holy Spirit can lead you in yourself, okay? I'm just giving you principles from the Word of God that I feel are very relevant to us right now. But some of you might be like, this is possible, there might be somebody, well, you convinced me that I shouldn't maybe listen to that music. Um, maybe you even convinced me that I shouldn't be listening to shut that off. Maybe I shouldn't even be listening to music that's that style with Christian words. Okay, you know, maybe, you know, not everybody, but there are probably some people. And, um, but you know, what about other kinds of music? Because there's so many different styles out there, okay? And this is kind of where we go. We go, well, you know, what about, uh, what about like, like pop music, like dance music? What about like country music, you know? And I don't want to be here and going through everything and talking, naming groups and songs and doing all that. I don't feel like that's necessary, okay? Um, but what about that? Well, I want to give you a thought, and that's this. What if the Apostle Paul wrote that letter, don't, don't eat meat offered to idols? And then they said, well, well, Paul, what about if I mixed the meat half and half? What if I had one dish over here that was offered to idols, meat, and the other meat wasn't? What if I mixed it? What if I did, hey, well, what if I did 10%? All right? I wonder what Paul's response would have been if you go read that passage, all right? So you think about it, you know. Now, if you're talking about something like country music, there's actually a big difference between old-fashioned country music and country music today, isn't there? 
Okay, now, now we're not talking about words. I think any Christian can say, well, if music has words that aren't honoring the Lord, we shouldn't listen to it. That's pretty clear. But when I was talking about just a style, hey, there's a lot of country music today that literally just sounds like rock and roll. Have you noticed that? I'm not the only one who noticed that. But yeah, there's a lot of groups from the 70s, and that was called rock and roll back then. And now they call it country. It's playing on the country station, and it sounds like rock and roll. Okay? Well, maybe the only difference is you can probably understand the words if you want to understand the words. Maybe you would rather not. Um, and so just, just think about that. that. That might be a form of sitting down to a meal in Corinth and having half meat that was offered to idols, or you have some sausage over here that's offered to idols, and you have some steak over here that's not. And kind of consider that. like So it's kind of halfway, maybe, partway. In the same way with like top 40 pop song, maybe it has a dominant beat but doesn't have the grinding electric guitars or rap music. It might have a dominant beat but not you know some of those. And so just kind of think that through in your mind. And I think you'll be able to come to a good conclusion on your own based on the Bible, not based on what your pastor's opinion, but based on the Bible. Okay, I just wanted to mention that because I thought some of those thoughts might come to people's mind. Well, I'm safe because I'm not listening to heavy metal and I'm not listening to that music from the 70s that you would... Use discernment and understand, study those scriptures, go back and watch that sermon again, if you want to, and take those principles that are very clearly taught in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 that we talked about, and use the Bible and apply the Bible to your own life, and now it's not between you and your pastor, it's not between you and your dad or, your, or the tradition you grew up in, anything like that, it's between you and the Lord, and ask the Lord to show you, ask the Lord to show you. So, this is the second song in the Bible that we have, um, and it is, um, I call it, a song of separation. The first song is the song of salvation. And what we're doing is we're talking about these four songs that are in the Bible, song of a song of salvation, a song of separation, a song of spiritual warfare, not, not all in one day, all right, the future ones as well, and a song of service, okay? We're talking about four, and it's actually in order. It's the first four songs that appear in order in the Bible. It's the first four songs. You have the song of salvation that was sung at the Red Sea. Then you have the song of separation that, that, that we're reading about today that Moses sang, and God commanded him to write it. And he sang it to uh, the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're starting at 31, but chapter 32. And then you have a song of spiritual warfare, which was Deborah and Barak. This is the book of Judges. We're going to study that. And then there's one more song. I mean, there's many other songs in the Bible, but these are the first four, and they really do cover all of the topics that the songs that we believe the Lord wants us to sing in church, okay? The Lord wants us to sing at home. Let's do all these topics. They're covered in these four songs. And then the final one is David's song, and it uh, appears in um, at 2 Samuel, and it's the, day, it's the song that the Lord gave him when the Lord delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and the hand of Saul, it says. And that song is a song of service. Because David talks about how the Lord chose him to be his servant, to serve the Lord, and to and uh, and, and and there are some very very important principles. And you will find all those principles and all those in in our hymn book. And I've told you before, our hymn book is not really properly named. All hymn, uh, both the red one and the white one we have, they are really not just hymns. They're psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I explained you the difference. A psalm is a song that comes directly from the words of Scripture. Okay, so like word for word from Scripture, a psalm like psalms in, in the book of Psalms, right? That's what psalm means. And then hymn, the Greek word, hymn is a Greek word that actually means a song to God. So a hymn is when you are singing directly to God. That is in the first person, that would be a hymn. And then a spiritual song would be any song that is teaching spiritual principles that we get from the Word of God. So it could be talking to another person. In fact, if you look at the book of Psalms, Half of the Psalms in the book of Psalms are not addressed to God. They're actually addressed to people. All right? They're addressed to other people. Um, and the Bible says, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So that's a very important part of, of, uh, of singing. And the Bible has a lot to say about music. I could probably spend a year just preaching on what the Bible says about music. And if I decided to go through all the way through the Psalms, I'd probably be here for several years. Okay? The Bible has a ton to say about music, which means. Music's an important topic to God. It's not a minor issue. I'm going to turn that down a teeny bit. apologize for those of you who are freezing to death, but I have to, I'm getting overheated. So, all right. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31. And so this is just to give you a background of the song. Is, uh, I'll start reading in verse 16. 
Okay. Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up, and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant which I have made with them. See, God knew ahead what they were going to do. It's amazing, you know. Kind of like, you know, your kids. You tell your kid not to do something. Oh, he's probably going to go disobey. So you go around the corner and you peek and you catch him in the act, you know. So I tell parents all the time. They're like, oh, my kid's always being bad. I'm like, set him up. Go put the no-no right there. And we'll go around the corner and wait. Peek. You catch him in the act. Now he can't lie and say he didn't do it. Now you can punish him. Do that over and over again, you know. Pretty soon, you leave that thing out in the middle of the room and he's going to and he's going to drive his car. And he's like, so we can predict ahead of time you know, what our children are going to do, and God knew what they were going to do. Verse 17, Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, I don't know what they were going to say, and isn't this the way we are? We sin, we do something wrong, we experience the consequences, and then we say, why is God allowing this to happen to me? And here it is. Then they so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? So they're going to sin, and then bad things are going to happen because they sin. And they're going to say, well, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care about me. God's not here. He's far away. That's why. No, no, no. That's not why. It's because of the wrong choices that we all make, including your pastor. We all make wrong choices. We all experience consequences for our wrong choices. Verse 18. And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought. In that day they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore, write ye this song for you. Wow, God told him, I want you to write a song. Do you know over and over in the Bible, God's people are commanded to sing a new song to the Lord. We are commanded to sing a new song. So we are to be writing new songs. That is an important part. Now, not everybody has singing, uh, playing ability. Not everybody has the creativity to write songs. That's different about different abilities, different gifts, but yet that is a command that God's people are to continually write new songs. Uh, that, that is important. It's a way of recording things that God has taught us and things that the Holy Spirit is teaching us. We record them and we sing them, and then now those things last. As I tell you many times, the stories of these different hymns, right? So somebody wrote a song like in the 1800s or in the 1900s, and we're still singing that song today, and that was a testimony of something the Lord did in that person's life. And so we are commanded to write songs. So he says to Moses, write me this song for you. Teach it in the children of Israel. In the, teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that the song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. He knew if there was a song, and people were singing the song, that people would remember what God had said. For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat. Not necessarily saying they were all going to be 300, 400 pounds, but saying they were going to get comfortable and, and, and then they were going to forget about God because things were going too good. Then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. By the way, just because you break your covenant with God doesn't mean God breaks his covenant with you. All right? Um, um, you have the power. We have our side of the covenant, How what we're supposed to be doing. And, and God says, if you obey me, I'll, I'll reward you. And if you disobey me, there are going to be negative consequences. Uh, but we're still God's children, even when we break our side of the covenant. It shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, uh -huh, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about, even now, before I have brought them into the land, which I swear. Moses, verse uh, 22, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. Okay? In English, we'd say taught it to, but in the original language, it, it, it just taught it, and the children of Israel are the direct object of the verb taught. So that's why it doesn't have the to in there. Okay? And then down in verse 30, skipping over for the sake of time, verse 30, Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song, until they were ended. All right. Now, um, here is the song. All right. Here's the song. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the flower showers sorry, upon the grass. 
because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Now, as you know, as we look at these songs, what we're doing is we're understanding what the songs in the Bible, these first four songs appear in the Bible, what they're teaching, and how that needs to be what the songs that we sing and that we listen to are also teaching. And one of the things we're going to see, as I think we're already seeing it, but especially going to see as we go on is the topics are a little different than what we like. Hey, listen. The music that we sing, the words that we sing, they need to be things that edify and benefit and help us to grow in our faith and our walk with the Lord. Not necessarily just what affirms us and makes us feel good. We need that. There's nothing wrong with affirmation and biblical truth that helps encourage us. But we need to have songs that rebuke and songs that correct so that we keep ourselves on the right track. And music is powerful that way. Because, you know, if you came to church and I preached a scorched earth, fiery sermon, you know, and half the people are saying amen and half the people are squirming and you don't like it or whatever, and you can go home and be like, oh, pastor, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of, what, what about the, the, the happy, peaceful verses in the Bible about God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life? That's in the Bible too. But why is he preaching all this fire and brimstone when there's a good stuff and, and why don't we have a better balance and, and maybe I think I'm balanced and maybe you only remember the fiery ones all right I preach lots of encouraging messages you know that but you may only remember the fiery ones or if you attend church infrequently the Holy Spirit may be sure that you only hear the fiery ones and the Holy Spirit sometimes will just for whatever reason to change a pastor's mind when he's going to preach and he, all week, he was working on this happy, peaceful, encouraging message, and all of a sudden, Saturday night, just something restless. No, God, you want to preach something different? So he, everything changes, and he didn't necessarily even choose that. He just felt like, I don't know, I'm supposed to do that. I've known pastors who lost their sermon notes when they got up to preach. They couldn't find them. And they couldn't remember anything they were going to say. And then another passage came to their mind. They thought, well, I guess God wants me to preach that. So they just started preaching this sermon. They hadn't even prepared nothing. And if somebody's in visiting that church, somebody has to be in church that day, and it's exactly what the Lord, Lord wants them to hear. So what I'm getting at is this. You can kind of explain away or rationalize a lot of times what a pastor preaches, or you can pick and choose. You know, this is why I tell people, you need to read through the whole Bible on a regular basis, because if you don't, you're only going to go to the passages that you like that make you feel good, and you're going to avoid all the passages that you need to hear, right? Um, and uh, so that, that's very important that you let the whole Bible speak to you, all right? And then that's hopefully, prayerfully, it's what the Holy Spirit leads the pastor to do is preach a variety of sermons on a variety of topics, a variety of places in the Bible, not just his favorite hobby horses or his particular favorite um, passages. But what I was trying, my point in that is this, the reason that we need the right kind of songs in our hymn books and in our special music and that we sing and that we and that we listen to maybe driving the car and, you know if you're really really old-fashioned like me maybe you have a cd player or cassette player maybe maybe you have an apple i oh I, ipods are kind of a thing of the past now iphones or whatever and you you listen on while you're driving or you're jogging or whatever the reason we need to choose the right kind of music and singing is because we need to have those ideas in our minds so the holy spirit can speak to us teach us and correct us um and so these topics that are in these songs are important. And so these, these four verses I just read, okay, they speak of the righteousness of God. It says, he is the rock. Well, it says, I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. Now, that's not the rock that's the, the professional wrestler, right? His, his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, which means judgment means like what is right and what is just. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. The righteousness of God. You know, when we sing songs, you know, we, we need to have in our songs we listen to, in the songs we sing in church, the songs that we sing at home, songs we sing when we're out doing something, we need to have songs about the righteousness of God. How God is sinless. He can never do wrong. He's always right. And that we would really believe that and trust in God. Because you can't obey a God that you think is doing things wrong. We need to believe 
that he is a God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. You know, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Or how would you think about it? Um, um, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. There's so much about the righteousness of God. We gotta believe that our God is holy and righteous and just, and he does everything right. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. If I, you know, Christianity, it starts with God is right and I'm wrong. That's Christianity. God created the world and he established what's true and what's right. And I'm the one that's wrong and I need to change. And that's true of all of us. That's true of your pastor. The Lord co corrects me all the time, probably more than once a day. God shows me something that's not right that I need to work on a change in my life. We need to say God is right and I am wrong. God is just. God is righteous. He can't do anything wrong. The Bible says God cannot lie. He can't do anything wrong. It's not consistent with his nature. Everything he does is right. I mean, he, he created all of reality. He knows what is right. But he, the reason that there's sin in the world is because he created freedom. So the righteousness of God, verses 1 through 4. And then in verses 5 through 6, it says this. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Oh, oh, wait, this is really negative. Did he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Only a sinner saved by grace. Hey, listen, we need to hear about the sinfulness of people. Wait, that's so negative. No, we get it backwards, don't we? Oh, people are basically good, but God, he's not managing the universe right. I don't agree with what he's allowing. Why do kids die of cancer? And why do bad things happen? Why did God allow some friend of mine die in a car accident? Why did God allow my 27-year-old sister to die? You know, we can think those kind of thoughts and we get it backwards, don't we? Now, we're the godly ones, we're the righteous, and God is the sinner. We need the right kind of music that teaches that God is righteous, the righteousness of God and the sinfulness of people. And we need to have the right kind of songs that teach it. I'm not talking about saying I'm a horrible person and I can never do anything right and I have no value. No, 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 not that. You're created in the image of God. God loves you. But when it comes to who's right and who's wrong, God's right and you're wrong. And God's right and I am wrong too, okay? We have to see that. We have to understand that. And we need music. That's not just the top 40 song that we keep. <laughs> you know, when I was a teenager, the, the number one song was Butterfly Kisses. Remember that one? <laughs> All the men are driving. And it's a song about his daughter who gives him butterfly kisses. And then, and it's a beautiful song. There's nothing wrong with the song. And then, like, men, grown men are driving on the road, and they're pulling over to the side of the road and crying because it's about, and the whole thing goes, and at the end, she'll change her name today. I'll walk her down the aisle and give her away. And then she looks at him, and one last time, she gives him butterfly kisses before she leaves, you know. One part woman, other part girl. Perfume and makeup, Christmas and curls. I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know all the words. Okay, but that song played over and over and over again. You know, and I kind of think, you know, maybe you're thinking, well, that was dumb. It's not my generation. I don't know. I'm trying to say it was like people love butterfly kisses. It was at every every um, wedding. Butterfly kisses, and the dad's walking his daughter down the aisle. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm giving my daughter. Away. And there's nothing wrong with the song. It's a good song. I'm not saying anything wrong with the song, but but you know what? Music can't all be things that um, make us feel good. And it's, we don't know. We need to have God's word. And we need to say, God is righteous and people are sinful. So we're not saying you're a terrible person. We're all horrible people. No, no, we're not saying that. What we're saying is, God is right and we are wrong. And people are sinful. And we need to repent of our sins. Jesus loves us. Our sins can be forgiven. But we need to acknowledge that God is right and we're wrong. The, the righteousness of God and the sinfulness of people. 
You know, he says, you thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise. Verse 6, is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Wait a minute, God, God created the world. And he says, he is right and he is wrong. God is right and we are wrong. So the righteousness of God, they corrupted themselves, the sinfulness of people. We need songs about that. We have those kind of songs. We need to be singing those kind of songs. We need to be listening to those kind of songs. We need to be having those kinds of songs in our church services. Now, um, look at verse 7. So, number one, the righteousness of God. Number two, the sinfulness of people. These are the topics that we need to have in our songs. Okay? And here in verse 7, look what it says. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. The elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. This is beautiful. I, I just get all emotional when I read the songs in the Bible. They're so, so beautiful. Now, I'm a songwriter, but this is amazing. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He's talking about how God chose Jacob, look, it says, he found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. Wow, that's kind of strange. I looked that up in Hebrew. You know what it says in Hebrew? The waste howling wilderness. <laughs> word for word. He found him in it. No, no, I'm not joking. I actually did read this whole passage in Hebrew. I, I always read it in Hebrew and Greek before I preach because I want to understand it. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the language changes over time. And then what I think it sounds like it's saying is not, is not quite what it sounds like. And so I, 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 I benefit from that. So he found him in a desert land in the waste, howling wilderness. You know, Jacob, he's out and he's, he just cheated his brother. And then he's out and, and he's off in the wilderness and he goes off to find a wife and he ends up with four that are fighting with each other. And it's just, and then he has 12 sons and then they're beating up the, the favorite son and shipping him off. To, you know, he, and Jacob had, a pro, had problems, you know. But God went and found him. And look what it says. He says, in the waste, howling wilderness, just out in the middle of nowhere. And he led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. You know, the apple of your eye is your eyeball. If you ever get something in your eyeball, boy, you try to get that out. You protect your eye. We wear PPE at, at uh, Cardinal Glass. It's protection. Personal protective equipment, and we always wear um, uh, um, uh, safety glasses. That's the word I'm looking for. I only wore them my whole life. I can't remember what they're called. <laughs> safety glasses. Why? Because we're protecting the apple of our eye. So the Bible says over and over in the Bible that we are, we, we're, yes, it's as interesting, the righteousness of God, the sinfulness of people, and yet God looks at his people like he's protecting his own eyeball. He's so sensitive. There's a verse that says, he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Did you know that when somebody attacks you or hurts you or does something to you, if you are a child of God, do you know it, it's like poking God in the eye? That is why on the road to Damascus, Jesus said to Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? He thought he was just persecuting Christians. Jesus said, you're persecuting me. And then he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. God takes it personally. You're the apple of his eye. Not because you're righteous, but because you belong to him. See, the righteousness of God, the sinfulness of people. But then, that's the separation of God's people. The separation. That's why I call it a song of separation. Because he took, he divided up the nations, and he set the boundaries according to the number of the children of Israel. When he divided them, scattered them, and he planned to, to bring Abraham out and to give him the land. And then he went and found Jacob in the howling wilderness. And he guided him. And Jacob was a jerk. I mean, you want to read about a real jerk, read about Jacob. <laughs> you know, I, we thought about that years ago, and, and I called it the dysfunctional family that God used. In fact, I like to say this. I challenge anyone to find any family they've ever met or known or ever been heard of in history that was more dysfunctional than Jacob's family. I'm telling you, you can't find anybody more dysfunctional. And I don't even want to talk about in the pulpit some of the horrible things that went on in that family. They were as dysfunctional as it comes. And yet God used them. And those 12 men, their names are on the gates of the, of the New Jerusalem. 
Why? Because God wants to show how he can take something horrible and turn it into something wonderful because of his grace. And we need that, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The separation of God's people. God goes and finds us and he purchased us. He purchased us with his blood and he says, it doesn't matter if you're a Jacob. I'm going to turn you into an Israel. Remember Jacob? He wrestled. Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him till the breaking of the day. Jacob was such a loser. He was such a jerk. You know, years ago I was working at Culver's and, and I had a friend there who was a, was a Christian who I baptized and, and I was in the freezer with him and, and he was already in the freezer and he was wearing a jacket and everything and I don't remember how it came up but I said to him, his name is William, hey, maybe you're watching, hi William, um, I could be so lucky. Anyway, and I said, William, do you want to know the differences between Christianity and every other religion? He said, what? I said, Christianity's for losers. And he said, he looked at me and said, I just got goosebumps all over when you said that. You know that? That's the difference. That's the real difference. How do you, you got a verse for that? Pastor is throwing out all these ideas I've never heard. You got a verse for that? Yeah. Now, God didn't choose many wise. God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak and the base things of the world. If you read the Bible, you know what you'll see? It's nothing but losers in there. Nothing but losers. It's amazing. So I'm glad that I get to be with all those losers. But you know, Jesus said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. You know what you find out when you read the book of Revelation, everybody in heaven? All the losers are the winners. You know why? It's like that elephant that was marching over the bridge and it was shaking and there's a little bird sitting on top of the elephant. And they get to the other, the whole bridge is shaking while the elephant's walking across the bridge. Gets to the other side and that bird whispers to the elephant, boy, we sure made, boy, we sure made that noise. Didn't, boy, we sure made, a, made that bridge shake, didn't we? That bird didn't make the bridge shake. The elephant did. Hey, Jesus is the winner. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Through him. Christianity is for losers. Did you know every other religion? I've studied them. I grew up in other religions, not believing them, but around people who believe those things. They're all about your own effort. Man. You've got to be a better person. You've got to try harder. Christianity is for losers. And Jacob, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob. Jacob is a lot of inheritance. And so Jacob wrestles with the angel. And he said, I won't let you go until you bless me. He wanted that blessing. And God, the angel, touched his thigh and put his thigh out of joint. And he walked with a limp. It says, and the sun rose upon Penuel, and he halted upon his thigh. You know, the rest of his life, Jacob walked with a limp. You know, you and me, after God's done with us, we're all going to walk with a limp. <laughs> And somebody probably asked him, then his kids asked him, said, Hey, Dad, why do you walk like that? And he probably said, You should have seen the other guy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and he said, now Let me tell you a story about what a loser I was. But I wrestled with an angel and I asked him to bless me. And he gave me this. And he changed my name from Jacob, which means the person who grabs you by the heel. Somebody tries to trip you up. That was Jacob. Just a jerk, really. That's the, that's the, my, my paraphrase is Jacob was a jerk. And he named me Israel. As a prince, hast thou power with God and with man has prevailed. Amazing. God is righteous. People are sinful. That's true. But the separation of God's people. He found him in a desert land. In the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. And this is beautiful here, verse 11. As an eagle stirreth up her nest. You know, think about an eagle. Eagles always make nests near a river and like on the side of a cliff or like overlooking a river high up. And that eagle will stir up the nest, get it all ready for those babies. And look at this. This is God is like that eagle. Gets everything ready. Fluttereth over her young. Eagles, eagles watching over, fluttering her, her wings, protecting. Spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. You know, by the way, an eagle teaches the little eaglets, is that what you say? No, I'm just saying. The little, little baby eagles to fly. They climb on her back. 
she flies up really high and she flips over and they start falling. They're falling and flapping their wings, flies underneath, catches them on her back again, flies up again, flips them over. Ah! I don't know what an eagle voice makes. I'm sorry. I didn't do my, I read it in Hebrew, but I didn't study eagles. And, uh, <laughs> um, and then goes down and <laughs> catches them again. Every time you think you're going to fall. God is the mother eagle. It's going to catch you again. Just teaching you to fly. Teaching you to fly. That's how God cares for us. That's how he watches over us. As an eagle stirs up her nest, fluttering over her, flutters over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Listen. So the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth. That he might eat the increase of the fields, he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Hey, there's rocks and hard and difficult things in your life. And the Bible says God will all things work together for good. He'll make it so that you get something sweet, honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Something that is rich and good for you. Butter of kind, kind is plural for cows. A butter of kind and milk of sheep with the fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat. Kidneys of wheat, is that, that's the wheat berry. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. You know, um, just what I was reading in Hebrew recently, I found out something. The word for blood. I didn't know this before. I always knew what the word blood was in Hebrew. It's dam. I knew that. I'm not so dumb that I don't know what dam means. But... It's also used for grape juice. So now you know why Jesus said, this is my blood. This is my blood. Because it's the color of blood. Grape juice is. When you have a really dark purple grape, dark red grape, it says, and that it's drink the pure blood of the grape. And that's referring to all of the ways that God provides for our needs. All the ways that God nourishes and protects us and, and takes care of us. So that's the separation of God's people. God separated his people from everybody else. Say, hey, listen, you are a child of God. There's a time in your life when you ask Jesus to forgive your sins, you're a child of God. You are separated from everyone else. He wants you to walk with him and not follow after the world. Um, so there's the righteousness of God, verses 1 through 4. The sinfulness of God's, of people, verses 5 through 6. And then in verses 7 through 14 is the separation of God's people. That God separates us from the rest of the people in the world and he wants us to belong to him. Separation is not popular. It's not a bad word. You know, I just watched the wedding, my wedding, the video of my wedding on VHS. <laughs> That's how old I am. My wedding is on VHS. So, um, but anyway, in that video, I say to my wife, when I said, forsaking all others. Forsaking all others. That's separation. I'm not looking at anybody else. She's not looking at anybody else. We're separated for each other. God separates his people along him. He wants everyone to be his people. The call goes out to the whole world. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. But when you enter in, then you're separated. And you become his. And he loves you. And wants you to follow him to serve you. And we need that in our songbook. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. So that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. That's the separation. we got to have that in our songs. But it doesn't end there, does it? Look at verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. <laughs> thou art waxing fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Isn't it true that every single one of us, after we were saved, 
there got to be a time when we were feeling pretty good. That's what it means to talk about waxing fat, like fat and sassy, like, yeah, things are going pretty good for us. We're pretty happy. Everything's, and we forget about God and we forsake God and we start doing wrong. We all do that. All we like sheep have gone astray. You think it's only people who aren't saved? Oh my goodness. Read the Bible. Look at your own life. We all fail. We all sin. After we're saved. So the Bible says we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's the righteousness of God, the sinfulness of people, the separation of God's people, and then the disobedience of God's people. We need to we don't need to sing about that, Pastor. Let's just pretend we're all perfect. Huh. Uh, Good luck with that one. And so that's why he will say churches are full of hypocrites. Because Christians act like they're perfect when they're not. We all sin. We all fail. That's why we have a song. I wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. We got to come back to the Lord. We got to repent. Yes, as believers. You know, one thing people miss there's always a debate. You know, there's a pastor here, you probably heard it. There's always a debate between the Lordship, salvation, or repentance, people, repentance versus grace alone. All these arguments just believe. Is it easy believism or is it repentance? You know, all those things. And you know what? You know what? I think a lot of times I've missed in that. I've got my own view on that whole controversy. I wrote a whole book about it. But you know, um, I think what's often missed is that repentance is something that you do your whole life. God wants us to continue to repent. Did you know, if you study every occurrence of the word repentance in the Bible, most of the time, this is pretty interesting, both Old and New Testament, most of the time, it's either talking about God repenting, which is changing his mind because we prayed, or because we changed what we're doing, not repenting of sin, but God repenting, changing his mind, or turning and, and deciding to do something different, or it's about God's people repenting. People who are already in a covenant with God in the New Testament as well. There's a lot of teaching about God's people repenting. And you know, the Christian life is continual repentance. And you'd be like, well, I thought you said like we're married to God and, and you're supposed to be totally loyal to your spouse. Yeah, hey, you know the only way to make your marriage work is if you ask forgiveness a lot. You know, people have said this, you know, you know what a good marriage is? It's not two good people. It's not two perfect people. It's two people who have learned how to forgive. That's marriage. You gotta ask your spouse to forgive you because you're gonna fail. Repentance. Because why? Because we disobey, we fail, we fall. The separation, no, I'm sorry, the disobedience of God's people. They provoked, verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. We just preached on that last week, didn't we? The song of idolatry. And before, we're too judgmental of those people dancing and naked in front of that golden calf playing a song of war. Before we get too judgmental of them, do we ever have times where something becomes more important to us than God? Anything that I'm going to obey or follow when I have a choice between obeying God and doing this, that thing becomes my God. It's more important to me. That's why I'm choosing that over God. So we all have times when we have idols in our lives. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You know, we need to talk about idolatry in our songs. Because we have problems with idolatry in our churches and in our families and in our own walk with the Lord. And so we need songs that talk about that. Let's talk about the idolatry and repent of the idolatry. Let's not just sing songs and make us feel good and not just talk about butterfly kisses. <laughs> okay? We need more than that. We need to talk about the idolatry. And Moses puts the idolatry in the song to remind them. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten the God that formed thee. Number one, the righteousness of God. Number two, the sinfulness of people. Number three, the separation of God's people. Number four, the disobedience of God's people. Oh, but now, before we turn it positive, we got to be a little more negative, and we got to have that in our music. Verse 19, and when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. 
Hey, listen, years ago, I was on my way to someone's house. I was, I was trying to save somebody's marriage. And I was on my way to someone's house, and, and, and they were someone, and I'm, I'm praying that the Lord would save that person's marriage. But I was on my way to that person's house, and I was going to have one last conversation with them before they went to go visit with one of the people who was separated because of their problems in their marriage. And I, this scripture came into my mind. Children in whom is no faith. And I knew in my heart, not only the marriage, the people whose marriage I was trying to save, but the people, the person I knew, I had no contact with the person, so they were my only ambassador between me and that person. This was before I was a pastor. But I knew that person that I was going to beg and plead with, will you say some of these things to that person when you have that opportunity to talk to them? I knew that that person had no faith that that marriage would be restored. And so I knew there was not a very good chance that that person that I was sending to talk to this other person that I couldn't talk to, that they would say the things that needed to be said. And the scripture that came to my mind is children in whom is, in whom is no faith. And this passage is talking about God's people when it says children in whom is no faith. You know, the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please him. We have to, and faith is trust. I always tell you, like, faith is trust. And that's why they're doing what they're doing, because they didn't have faith. And God said, children in whom is no faith. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. We have to have faith in the word of God. Uh, verse 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy which those, with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Um, in that passage there, he says something interesting. He said, they're provoking me to anger with their idols. And I am going to provoke them. No, they're provoking me to anger with that which is not God. So they have false gods. So he said, I'm going to provoke them to anger with people who are not a people. You know what he was saying? He was saying, if, you, if my people worship idols, I'm going to bring people who are not my people and let them conquer and take over the land. You know what happens here in America? Christians are worshiping idols, but they're like, but I'm still a Christian. And they think that they're better than unsafe people or than the, the liberals that are destroying our country. But Christians are worshiping idols while they're judging the liberals who they think are destroying America. And God says, well, if you're not going to deal with your idols, if you're going to worship something that is not a God, I'm going to allow America to be turned over to a group of people who are not my people. That's serious. But God said he'll do that. And here's why. It's a consequence. So number five is the consequences of disobedience. That's the consequence. See, we don't always think about the consequence when we do. We think, oh, well, I'm going to sin. I'm going to go worship my little idol. Then I'm going to come back, and hopefully there won't be any consequences. Hey, listen, we need to have the consequences of disobedience in our songbook. We need to talk about what are the consequences, because there are consequences. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, verse 22, and shall burn into the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat, with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust, the sword without, the terror within, and shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Whoa! His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. You know, we need to be singing about the consequences of disobedience. Because otherwise we'll think, well, I can always just disobey God and then ask forgiveness and it's all better. It's not true. You can't always go back and restore that marriage has been broken. You can't always go back and bring that person back to life who died because of your wrong choices. You can't always go mend and fix everything you did. You can't go back and get back those wasted years. Yes, God will forgive you. And yes, you can be restored to fellowship with him. And yes, he can turn your situation into something wonderful. But there are still consequences. And we must have the consequences in our songs. We must 
be singing about that because otherwise we'll think we can sin without consequence, and that is not true. That's the consequence of disobedience. And God said there's going to be consequences, and that's what he's talking about in that passage. And then verse 26, I said, this is interesting, God is talking here. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, unless they should say, Our hand is high, and God hath not done, and the Lord hath not done all this. Now, this is amazing to me that God said he feared something. Now, if you study the passage, it's not that God is actually afraid. What he's saying is if he just judged his people, if he just allowed his people to be wiped out and overcome, and who was the one who prayed and told him this? It was Moses, who said, Lord, what are the nations going to say? And God says this in the psalm. He says, I, was, I feared the wrath of the enemy. Now, he wasn't afraid of those people, but he was concerned about what they would say if he totally wiped out his people and that's why he decided not to do it because he was concerned about his reputation so he says they were going to say god didn't do this we did it if they were able to totally wipe them out so that's why he's not going to totally wipe out his people for they are a nation. Now in their talk, he's talking about the unsaved people. The people are not his people. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? Remember how many times a small group of people had victory over a large group of people in the Bible because they trusted in God? Except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up. So he's saying this. These wicked nations, they're strange. They, they don't think because they're, they see miracles, but then they just think, oh, that just happens because we were better fighters or whatever. They don't realize that God was the one that actually made that happen. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons, all right, that's a reptile, and the cruel venom of asps, that's a, that's a serpent. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and things that shall come upon them make haste. So he's saying he is going to judge the nations. Did you know that? God is going to judge the nations. That's the judgment of God on the nations. We need to sing songs about that, about the judgment that's coming on the nations. And then finally, we have the mercy of God on his people. Verse 36, For the Lord shall judge his people and re re repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he. There is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. This is a fascinating passage here to me. Verse 40. For I lift up my hand to heaven. This is God making a vow. And I say, and say, I live forever. Right? So they should say, the Lord liveth. But he says, I live forever. And if I wet my, wet means to, to sharpen, right? If I wet my glittering sword in my hand, take hold on judgment. I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I was joking to someone last week that they should use this as their life verse. You know, they'll say, what's your life verse? What if you, everybody was raising their hand and said, what's your life verse? They say, well, my life verse is Deuteronomy 32, 42. They're like, what's that verse? I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. <laughs> now that's something that God said. God says, I'm coming back. I am going to have mercy on my people. Even though there's the righteousness of God, the sinfulness of people, the separation of God's people, the disobedience of God's people, the consequences of disobedience, 
and the judgment of God on the nations, there's the mercy of God on his people. And with the blood of the slain of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy, rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and we render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. You see, it says it will be merciful unto his land and to his people. That's the mercy of God's people. Do you know what else we need to have in our songbook? We need to have songs about the mercy of God on his people, that God is going to judge the nations and he is going to have mercy. And it says he will be merciful unto his land and to his people. You know what he said? I whip my glittering sword. Well, maybe that's just figurative. I, I say, I lift up my hand to heaven and I say, I live forever. And he says, I'll make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. Anybody remember Revelation 19? Jesus comes back and he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. And there's this angel. And he says to all the birds, God's got a really, really big supper plan for you. You're going to eat the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, you know, because all the vultures come when there's a big battlefield. <laughs> and God's like, I got a supper for you. you know, oh, that's so bloodthirsty. Hey, that's in the New Testament. Remember people said the Old Testament God is a God of wrath and the New Testament God is a God of love. I'll tell you, people who say that, they haven't read the Bible lately because this is in Revelation. But you know what God is saying? You can rebel against me. I'm going to give you chance after chance to repent. I'm going to send people to preach the gospel to you, but there's going to come a day where I'm going to come back. I'm going to make my arrows drunk with blood. My short sword shall devour flesh. And he says, Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. You know, we got songs, don't we, about the coming of Christ. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, and we shout the glad song. Christ returneth, alleluia, alleluia, amen, alleluia, amen. We need to sing about the coming of Christ. We need to sing about the coming judgment and God's mercy of his people. He said he'll be merciful unto his land and to his people. Jesus is coming back, and there's going to be a battle in the Valley of Armageddon. And you know nobody that's on Jesus' side is going to have to fight. It says they were all slain with the sword that came out of his mouth. <laughs> nobody's going to have to fight. Jesus is going to, he can take them all on single-handedly. And he's going to set up his throne in Jerusalem. He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And there's going to be peace on this earth. He will be merciful to his land and to his people. Hey, when we sing, Christianity is not just about the here and now. When we look at what's going on in the world and all the bloodshed and all the anger and all the rebellion and all the problems to know Jesus is coming back. And he's going to be merciful to his land and to his people. The Jewish people are not going to be fighting the Palestinians forever. There's going to come a day when Jesus is going to reign in Jerusalem.